In this video, we're going to talk about isolated systolic hypertension. It's one of the most difficult things to treat in hypertension. Isolated systolic hypertension is defined as systolic blood pressure above 140 and diastolic pressure below 80. Now, as long as the diastolic pressure is staying below 80 and the systolic pressure is going up, that's going to result in an increased pulse pressure. And usually, as the patient gets older, the pulse pressure is going to continue to increase. Isolated systolic hypertension is most common in elderly patients because the underlying mechanism of disease is stiffening of the central elastic arteries, such as the aorta and the carotid. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. So let's talk a moment to talk about the arterial tree and its properties. So the largest arteries are known as central arteries, and they are elastic in nature. Their job is to absorb cardiac output. They're going to stretch as the heart contracts, and they're going to absorb that cardiac output. Um, they have a lot of elastic fibers, and these are typically going to be the aorta, the carotid, and the, um, the iliac arteries. Next, we have the muscular arteries. These are also very large arteries, but not um, as large as the central, and their job is primarily to convey the blood from the central through to the arteries. These are going to be things like the femoral arteries, the popliteal arteries, the radial arteries. And then finally, we have the arterioles, which are the smallest arteries. And these are contractile in nature, and their job is to control resistance to blood flow. Almost all of the total peripheral resistance comes from the arterioles. Now in school, you probably learned that mean arterial pressure comes from the cardiac output times the total peripheral resistance. Now this equation explains diastolic, and it also explains mean hypertension. However, it doesn't explain systolic hypertension, and it also ignores the pulsatile elements of blood pressure. Pulsa what? the pulsatile elements. So if you take a look at this particular slide, what you're going to see is a waveform. You'll see the, arteri the aortic waveform, the carotid waveform, the brachial waveform, and the radial waveform. So what you'll notice is that there's slight changes as you go from a central artery down to a muscular artery. The other thing you'll notice is that when we take a blood pressure at the brachial artery, what we're doing is we're taking the peak and we're taking the trough, and that's all we're doing. We're getting rid of the rest of the information that this pulse wave provides. As it turns out, there's a lot more information that can be, that can be obtained if you actually measure waveforms as opposed to simply the peak and the trough of blood pressure. So the pulsatile elements are the actual shape and contour of this wave. In particular, extremely important is this very thick, very wide part of the systolic uh, wave in the aorta. So what that's showing is that the aorta is actually stretching open, and that's going to, it's actually stretching and it's absorbing blood flow, and that's going to prevent a large spike in that systolic pressure. So under ordinary circumstances, the aorta is going to stretch and it's going to accommodate the cardiac output. So every time the heart beats that stroke volume of about 70 milliliters, the, your body, your heart doesn't actually have to pump against all of the blood in the entire arterial tree to push all of the blood down by 70 milliliters. It only has to pump hard enough to make the carotid stretch 70 milliliters worth. Then the aortic valve will close, and then the stretch of the, of the aorta will slowly squeeze back down, driving the blood farther down the body. So the, the elastic nature of the aorta is going to reduce the amount of contractility that the heart has to produce in order to drive blood. Now, this is going to do a couple other things. Because 
there's still a lot of pressure in the aorta when the aortic valve is closed. That means that there's going to be a lot of pressure pushing into organs, and in particular, coronary artery. Now, if you think about this for a moment, take a look at your palm. Now, squeeze your palm as tight as you can and open it back up. Notice what happens. The blood returns to your hand. You, as you squeezed, blood was being driven from your hand, and when you relax, the blood flow returned. The exact same thing is happening in the heart. As, you're, as your heart contracts, blood is actually being squeezed out of the coronary arteries. The heart cannot be perfused when it's under systole. It can only be perfused under diastole. And having a higher diastolic pressure is going to actually drive perfusion pressure through the heart. Now, as a person ages, they're going to lose elastic fibers, and that is going to result in a stiffening of the aorta. So now, the aorta can no longer stretch to accommodate the cardiac output. Instead, the heart is going to have to generate enough pressure to actually push all of the blood in the entire arterial tree. That's going to result in a much stronger contraction and a much faster pulse wave. So, a stiffened aorta leads to a faster pulse wave of blood being pushed down the arteries. It's called pulse wave velocity. That's going to lead to a higher systolic pressure because the heart has to squeeze harder, but it's also going to lead to a longer systolic time because the heart not only has to be squeezed longer, but it also has to squeeze, sorry, it doesn't just squeeze harder, but it also has to squeeze harder and longer. Can't say that. That, in turn, is going to result in a higher amount of oxygen being required. In addition to the increased pulse wave velocity, what you're going to find is that there's an augmentation pressure. Now, when your heart generates a pressure wave, it's going to send the wave down the arterial tree, and then that pressure wave is going to reflect back. And usually, the reflection back occurs during diastole, which again raises diastolic pressure, which in turn helps to perfuse the heart. Now, when you have the increased pulse wave velocity, the reflection occurs much earlier and will eventually occur during systole. So now, the aortic valve is still open, the heart is trying to pump blood into the aorta, and all of a sudden, this wave reflection comes back, trying to push blood back into the back through the aortic valve back into the ventricle, and that is going to increase the workload of the heart even more. The bottom line is that isostolic, isolated systolic hypertension is going to increase with age as there's less and less elastic fibers in the aorta, and the aorta becomes stiffer. It's going to become readily apparent, typically in elderly patients around age of 65, and it's more difficult to diagnose in younger patients. However, it can still occur in younger patients, but it's just more subtle. As a result of isolated systolic hypertension, the heart is going to become vulnerable. It's going to require more oxygen. It's going to contract stronger. It's going to contract longer. There's going to be less time during diastole for it to rest. So there's less time for it to perfuse, and because the diastolic pressure is not as high, there's going to be less perfusion pressure during diastole. All of that makes the heart extremely vulnerable to ischemia. Now, as far as treatment of isolated systolic hypertension goes, the number one rule is it's difficult. Um, almost all of the therapies that we have that lower blood pressure are going to lower diastolic more than they lower systolic, and that's going to result in slightly not exactly what we're going for. So there's two basic ways you can go about trying to lower isolated systolic hypertension. The first is to target pulse wave velocity. There is variable research results. Some results, some trials show very good results for a particular treatment. Others show very poor for a particular treatment. So the rule is individualized treatment regimens and see what works for your patient. Don't be afraid to try different agents, typically low doses of those agents. You're not trying to lower blood pressure per se, you're trying to lower pulse wave velocity.
The second is to target augmentation pressure. Now, the major problem with, uh, with targeting augmentation pressure is that you need to selectively vasodilate large muscular arteries. An ab absolute best way to do this is to treat them with nitric oxide donors such as nitroglycerin. However, the problem with nitroglycerin is the patients are going to build up tolerance. But if you can do it, you know, if you can have a patient who's on for a certain number of hours and then off for a certain number of hours, that might be a very good way to do it. Um, another way you could try is with very low dose hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide has a unique property among the thiazide diuretics in that it causes a very slight vasodilation. So that can also help. Just as an example of agents that have been tried, the very first one, the AT2 receptor agonist, that's an angiotensin AT2 receptor agonist, is currently under trials and it works very well in rats. It reduces pulse wave velocity without reducing blood pressure, interestingly enough. All of these others have been tried with varying degrees of success, so they're things that you might want to consider trying in your own patients. I just do need to mention the very last one, Elagebrium, which is an advanced glycation end product breaker. Um, that one is still experimental, but supposedly it might show promise for this particular use. So far it's been tried for a lot of different things and the results have not been that wonderful. And then finally there are a number of nutritional supplements which may uh, positively impact pulse wave velocity, so you're also worth trying in a patient who has isolated systolic hypertension. Final take-home, isolated systolic hypertension can be particularly dangerous because as you try and treat it, you usually lower the diastolic more than you lower the systolic, and that puts the patient at risk for ischemia, just simply due to the dynamics of blood pressure perfusion. It's difficult to treat. Traditional therapies often lower diastolic pressure more than systolic, and you got to individualize your therapy. And just a couple of thoughts for the future. Arterial stiffening begins earlier in life. It doesn't suddenly occur at age 60. It's just that's when it shows up enough for us to be able to clearly see it. So in the future, we're going to have diagnostic tools that will help us to early identify patients who have arterial stiffening, and then we'll have treatments that can hopefully prevent that stiffening. Thank you very much.